All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. This channel is for educational purposes. And uh, today is video number 281 that we have done on Dewey Larson's reciprocal system of theory. And this system is a theory of everything that uh, if you learn it, you can plug it into any subject that you'd like and you will get uh, valid answers. Um, now it's fairly difficult to learn, but uh, it basically starts out with um, just the general composition of the universe. Unlike uh, the legacy scientists that you uh, had to study when you were in high school and so on, uh, who say that the universe is made out of matter, and more the 20th century people who are saying that the universe is made out of energy. Uh, Mr. Larson says that the universe is made out of motion. And for Larson, motion was the relationship between space and time. So we have a, a universe made out of motion, and motion is basically made out of space and time. Uh, motion is basically a fraction or a ratio where um, time or space is the numerator and space or time is the denominator uh, with the stipulations that space and time can come in uh, multiple dimensions, three dimensions, x, y, z coordinates for space, i, j, k coordinates for time. Uh, at least uh, as we observe it from uh, our vantage point. And then um, space and time also uh, both progress or they flow. They, uh, Larson calls it a scalar motion. It's a motion that has a magnitude but no particular direction. Uh, like time uh, that we measure, the clock, uh, the clock is always getting later and later and later and later but in no particular direction. And uh, space is always getting farther and farther apart, but also in no particular direction, which you can envision using a balloon with dots on it, blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other. And it, this was also observed by the Hubble telescope, all of the distant galaxies are moving away from each other. That is the progression of space or the flow of space and uh, Larson calls it clock space to go along with clock time. So you have coordinate space and coordinate time. And then you have clock space and clock time. Those are different aspects of time and space. The, uh, the third aspect is that um, both time and space are quantized, meaning that they come only in discrete units. There's no continuity there. They come in little chunks, very little, but little chunks. And if you don't have at least one chunk, then you don't have anything. You have one or you have none. You have to have a full unit to have anything. And then if you don't have two full units, then you still just have one and so on. So uh, it's what Larson calls the discrete unit postulate. Uh, time and space are quantized. And if you have exactly one unit of time, one unit of space in one unit of time, and, you know, time, as I said, uh, motion is a fraction uh, with time or space as the numerator and space or time as the denominator. Well, the motion that we know the best is speed. The car is moving 25 miles per hour. Well, 25 miles of space in one hour of time. Space over time. So that is the fraction of speed, space over time. And if you have exactly one unit of space in one unit of time, one over one equals one. That's what Larson calls unit speed. And that is also the speed of light. So the speed of light is one unit of space in one unit of time. Now, you can also see that reciprocal relationship there. If you say the car is moving 25 miles an hour 
and you say, oh, well, let's try to double, let's double the, double the speed. Uh, well, then you can say the car is now moving 50 miles per hour, 50 miles of space in one hour of time. But you could also say the car is moving 25 miles per half hour. So that is a reciprocal relationship. You can either multiply the space or you could divide the time and you get the same result. Okay, so those are the basic, uh, that's the basic first fundamental postulate of, of Larson. He had two postulates, the second of which isn't as important and uh, isn't as fu fundamental and it was actually rejected. It's been rejected by some of his followers, which is that the uh, universe... Um, conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its abs magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. Uh, one of his followers, Dr. Bruce Perrette, uh, came along and kind of rejected that idea of the Euclidean geometry. Not a full rejection, but an um, expansion, uh, where Lar uh, Perrette now says that the universe, uh, the geometry of the universe is projective. And Euclidean geometry is a subset of projective geometry. So Euclidean geometry is still part of the whole scene, but it, there's more to it. Um, and uh, we'll get into that at a later point. But we will get into Dr. Bruce Perrette today. We're looking at his, uh, one of his articles. Um, now, uh, uh, Dewey Larson died in back in 1990, and uh, since his death, uh, Dr. Bruce Perrette probably has done more than anybody to uh, expand and uh, popularize uh, to, to whatever limited extent he is popular because very, very few people know anything about any of this. Uh, but uh, until his death in 2020, uh, Dr. Perrette, it did some great work in um, extending the theory into other areas and also uh, kind of shoring up some of the weaknesses of the reciprocal system. Dewey Larson uh, claimed that the reciprocal system is correct, but whether he applied it correctly in all, situ in all situations was another question and that, you know, somebody would need to come around later on and, and correct his work if, uh, if it uh, became apparent. And so that's basically what happened. Larson published his fundamental postulates in the late 1950s, and then he deduced a theoretical universe from those postulates using a process of deduction, if this, then that, which I uh, outlined in uh, about 15 videos that I did about eight months ago, if you want to go back, they're called the Outline of the Deductive Development of the Reciprocal System, 165 different steps that Larson goes through to uh, go from his postulates to a whole universe, of, from which he wrote books on uh, you know, chemistry and physics and astronomy and so on. Um, and uh, we've gone over... Um, one or two of those books as well uh, in the past. Now, when Larson died in 1990, um, then Daniel started working on um, things and he, he um, shored up a few things having to do with uh, the geometry of the universe, also the, fo the mechanics of the photon, also having to do with uh, radioactivity, having to do with the scale uh, of the universe in both in terms of time and space. And, uh, but he also uh, wrote some more speculative stuff, uh, bringing in some of his background and some of his other interests, science fiction, uh, Jungian psychology, um, mythology, especially Norse mythology, um, and um, uh, m m uh, thinking, missing one, uh, one other thing here that's uh, relatively important. Oh, um, Taoism, Chinese Taoism. And uh, 
So he brought those things to the table as well, but he used the reciprocal system as really kind of like the fundamental basis uh, for some of this other research that he did under the pen name of Daniel Phoenix 3. And uh, you may know that Phoenix, the Phoenix 3 project uh, was also, um, uh, was the time travel aspect of the Montauk project, uh, which included the Philadelphia experiment, uh, a time travel um, snafu that occurred in 1983 top secret government uh, black ops kind of stuff. And so uh, I don't know for sure that Dr. Perrette was actually really involved in this or if this is just bringing in some more science fiction um, and just kind of uh, pretending like he did. But anyway, uh, we are currently reading his article that is called Geoengineering Chemtrails Harp world orders, timelines, and ascension. And um, we started working on this, um, uh, I believe, uh, two days ago. So this is the third day working on this. So if you want to start this article over from the start, go back two days and uh, you'll be able to uh, take over from the start. But right now, uh, we are on uh, about to begin a section that's called X-ray emission, faster than light to sublight speed. When high-speed matter drops below the speed of light, it must reacquire the isotopic mass that it lost. In uranium-236, the faster than light mass was only 132. When it drops back to sublight speed, that mass must increase back up to 236 atomic mass units, which is kind of backwards uh, radioactive emission on the other side of the speed of light boundary. The atom absorbs particles and emits x-rays, not radio waves, as it builds mass back. All elements dropping from faster than light motion to sublight will emit X rays. And all astronomical X ray uh, emitters are demonstrating this process, including our sun. Uh, so, X ray emission in the reciprocal system is just uh, kind of the reverse process of radioactive emission. When you have radioactive emission, uh, you know, you're, you're going from below light speed to faster than light speed. That causes the uh, ion level to invert, and then uh, the particle is ejecting uh, matter, and it's also ejecting radio waves. Radio waves are very long forms of electromagnetic um, uh, radiation, um, long waves, uh, but when it comes back to slower than light speed, then it ejects x-rays, which are very short. Now, in Larson's system, there is a boundary, uh, which is, I believe, in the far infrared range, very close to the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic um, uh, spectrum. And uh, it's, it's, I believe, in the far infrared that that's the, what he calls unit frequency. Um, it, it's uh, 6.576 times 10 to the 15 cycles per second. And um, although I think that's right, uh, although it might be a, a multiple of that, but... Um, on one side of the boundary is, uh, you know, faster than light, and on the other side is slower. And so, um, you know, you're seeing basically a mirror image. The, the image uh, of radioactivity ejecting radio waves is 
balanced out by the ejecting of x-rays. Okay, um, back to Perret here. The only sublight speeds in the sun are in the photosphere. Once you get deeper inside the sun, the magnetic ionization level is much higher and the age limit destructions are constantly accelerating matter to faster than light speeds, which is why the lower layers of the photosphere are a radio source. It is the boundary to faster than light motion. Every now and again, the sun burps and some faster than light matter comes out from the core to the photosphere immediately starts cooling and drops below the speed of light generating a burst of x-rays and a rapidly expanding plasma a coronal mass ejection cme because of the reciprocal relation faster than light motion is expanding in time so it is compressing in space by the reciprocal relationship between space and time. When it drops sublight speed, that compression re-expands like a spatial explosion. So coronal mass ejections are a good indicator of how turbulent the core is at faster than light velocities. Now you know that the reciprocal process to radioaction radioactive emission is x-ray emission and both have to do with crossing the faster than light boundary sublight motion in 3d space to faster than light motion in 3d time coordinate space and coordinate time faster than light acceleration produces radioactivity deceleration produces x-rays Okay, this, um, uh, just looking at the um, footnotes here to make sure that um, okay. This section is called the solar transition. Time to put the pieces together. The sun is getting hotter from all the dust and debris the solar system is now experiencing. Uh, the increased fuel will increase the thermal destructive limit, which will cause a corresponding increase in magnetic ionization level, which will make more elements available for the stellar combustion process. The sun is going to get brighter and hotter. Initially, this will occur as bright flashes, like a mini novae, or nova, until sufficient material is available to hold the magnetic ionization limit at the next quantum step. At that time, the sun will suddenly jump up in stellar class and remain there. Well, up in the reciprocal system, down in conventional astronomy since they have it backward or upside down in that example. The transition should be interesting. When the magnetic ionization level of the sun increases, it will be like throwing a cup of gasoline on the barbecue grill coals, a burst of flame and sudden and thermal activity. So much that it will move the thermal speeds past the speed of light. This inverse thermal emission actually occurs frequently on a small scale and is documented in detail in Professor KVK Nehru's paper, Glimpses, excuse me, Glimpses into the Structure of the Sun, the Solar Interior and the Sunspots, and is the reason that sunspots are dark and appear cool. Um, now, uh, just to remind you or let you know, if uh, Professor KVK Nehru is kind of uh, was kind of like Bruce Perrette's uh, running mate at a certain point. Uh, they both came up with what uh, was called RS2, this uh, reevaluation of the reciprocal system, 
and Nehru is a professor over in India um, and has written a lot of stuff that we'll, we'll be going through over the uh, course of, in the future, in the near future. Um, and so Nehru wrote this paper, Glimpses into the Structure of the Sun. Um, and uh, so uh, Pret is piggybacking on that research there. Um, and is the reason that the sunspots are dark and appear cool. Uh, just to, uh, as an aside, uh, basically Nehru is comparing the whole concept of sunspots on the surface of, a, of the sun with uh, hurricanes on the surface of the earth. Okay, actually, I'm not sure if that is actually Nehru's research or if that is Perret's uh, kind of um, expansion on Nehru's research. Either way, inverse or inverse faster than the speed of light thermal motion is super hot, so hot that it appears cold, and the region of the sun where it takes place goes dark, as in the sunspot, sunspot umbra. There are already indications of this beginning to occur, except this time the whole sun will become an umbra. There, there should be a bright flash like a nova, nova flare when the gas hits the fire, additional elements suddenly being available for fuel from the jump in magnetic ionization. Then the sun will go dark like it went out but only for a short time until the initial burst of new fuel has burned up and the sun returns to the zone of stability. Like most things, this has happened before and will happen again. Also, recall the radioactive transitions. When the magnetic ionization increases, there will be a huge burst of radio waves as the material is accelerated faster than light, along with the nova flare. The sun will go dark, faster than light motion, and when it starts to light up again, there will be a huge burst of x-rays from the sun, and the possible ejection of a great deal of matter from the surface of the sun due to the re-expansion of faster than light thermal motion back to sublight speed. Now, I'm not sure if Perret covers this later here in the paper, but in another paper, he, um, he does answer the question, you know, how, how long is the sun going to go dark for? And uh, I believe his answer is at most three days. So if this happens, don't freak out. <laughs> like the sun will come, if the sun's going to come back on, but you might have to uh, hunker down for a few days. Okay, this section is called uh, post-transition. After the transition is complete, the sun will be physically larger, brighter, more white than yellow, and hotter than before, and it is going to stay that way. One would think that this situation would make the inner planets go up like marshmallows burning on a campfire. Uh, but curiously, this is not the case. Seems that whoever designed stars and planets considered this and used the energy of transition to aid in the further explanation of life. What will happen is that due to the increased faster than light motion of the sun, in the sun, the gravitational balance of the solar system will change. The faster than light motion is anti-gravitational so the sun will literally push the planets further outward in their orbits in compensation. The year will get longer. Being further from the sun, the planet will survive and establish a new ecosystem, but a different one. The changes in the sun will also produce changes in the planets, particularly the electromagnetic alignment of the poles. As has been noted in geological records, the north and south poles of the planets have been in various locations across the globe, not because the poles are moving, but because the crust of the planet is moving relative to the mantle and the core. 
There is also a high degree of probability that the event will trigger a core flare, an expansion event of faster than light matter in the core, dropping to sublight speeds and causing the crust of the Earth to expand and open at tectonic boundaries, eventuating in more surface area and a drop in ocean levels as compensation. In my opinion, this solar transition is the harvest or ascension to a new state of life on Earth. Not just man, all, light, all life on Earth. All the physical properties get kicked up a notch, as Emeril would say, commonly known as a higher density or a higher dimension. Uh, okay, so yeah, he, re he refers to mythological references to three days of darkness. I may have the origin here. Um, he says less than three days because this one is, uh, is going to be faster than the one before, or than the ones before. And then um, he also said uh, this has been recorded in mythology, uh, the lengthening of the year occurring a number of times. Uh, we've gone through one of his earlier papers where uh, he, he does the dating, but uh, the, the year at one point was 260 days, and then it went up to 360 days, and then to 365 days. So uh, that's what he's saying in one of these footnotes. Now, uh, the next section is called A Hot Time in the Old World Tonight. And we will start that section next time out. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you for tuning in. And have a great day.